my talk is titled simply institutions. And what I wanted to share with you is a very brief, very tentative, very draft of an essay that will go into a special issue of social dynamics, uh, a special issue that invited commentaries on Jane Sears' essay, the mind of the Pisces, published in that journal 30 years ago. For what it's worth, it's an invitation that Moritz and I sent ourselves and others. Some of them are, are, are here, Yasha, Fernanda, and, and John. Um, so written on the eve of apartheid's demise, the mind of apartheid poses a deceptively simple question. It's not inconceivable that in the not too distant future, the era, era of apartheid will be proclaimed to be over. The unlovely creature will be laid to rest. But what exactly is it, Kutsia asks, that will be buried? But any notion of the post-apartheid will be impossible without an answer to this basic question, what was apartheid? It's to this question that the special issue returns using the uh, mind of apartheid as a, as a spur. Approaching the question, uh, again, this is an early draft, from an oblique angle, I'm interested in and have been for over two decades, or I've only been recently able to see this, uh, in institutions, institutions and subjectivity. I've looked at philanthropic institutions, cultural institutions like festivals, the post office, and the university. But driving this is always in the background, and letting not pretend otherwise. Uh, it's the enabling trauma of school, the sanctuary of study, and an institution I still sometimes fantasize about burning to the ground. The study of institutions is a field dominated by Foucauldian analysis, which I found productive to think of, think of Nancy's talk yesterday. But from beginning to end, from the history of madness to the history of sexuality, Foucault took aim at psychoanalysis. I believe that there are more interesting ways of using psychoanalysis to think about and think inside of institutions than the orthodoxies and straw man caricatures Foucault and Foucauldians have put into question. Put bluntly, I don't think this leaves you with the liberal subject. Uh, exactly the opposite. In the paper that I had initially proposed for the winter school was trying to set out how one thinks about a cultural and unconscious. And it in fact engaged Kwan's work. Uh, that I put that paper aside and submitted it elsewhere. I'm interested here in saying something about universities today. And in doing so, I draw on a recent literature review I wrote for a a sense appointed task theme on managerialism in university. Managerialism, in short, as the introduction of private sector principles and practices into public institutions. And I take Kutsia's psychoanalytic reading of sociologist Jeffrey Cornier as a point of departure for this. Specifically, what Kutsia calls the academic bureaucratic castle Cornier helped to build and in which he installed and walled himself against the phantoms of race mixing that threatened him from all sides. Drawing on Freud, Kutsia characterizes the version of apartheid Cornier set out in the period between 1945 and 1948 as a neurotic reaction formation. But Cornier's apartheid develops as a counter attack upon desire. So, seeing in this martial reaction a little too much protestation, apartheid becomes, in Kutsia's reading of Cornier, an elaborate forced removal of forbidden objects of desire, a repudiation that assumes the unconscious intensity of a kind of incest between Europeans over those who, supposedly still in the state of cultural childhood, it was their duty to act as guardians. And he would like to prohibit this intercourse from, from all sides, from the side of seductive parents and caretakers, Africana and Jocastus, and especially from the side of edible minors who don't know what they're doing. What makes it all the more neurotic is that he's trying to prevent what has already happened in a myriad ways. He's trying to unmix in the future what has already mixed. To be sure, Chris Cornelius was an extreme form of apartheid, that while leaving an impression on official and actual apartheid was also an embarrassment for Afrikaner nationalists, especially for later generations, but even those at the time he was writing. As could see a season, however, peering into the grave, as it were, a reading of Cornier's madness allows the text to be understood as a particular constellation of desire that, however repressed in the Pythet's discourse, however censored from its archives, had infected much of the white population in general. Indeed, Kutsia's reading implicates at every turn 
And the boldness of his essay is that it's difficult to know how far the contagion of this madness has spread, where the obsessive frock begins and ends right down to Quincy's reading itself, which identifies and identifies with the germ of the so as to know it. There is no clear line between the war on the passion that he reads and how he tracks it, follows it, and tracks it down. Does the content of Cornelius' ravings appear utterly outrageous today? The structure of the fantasy Kant represents, one in which mixture between white and black can be stamped out, is not possible, where European ideas are off limits to, to blacks. This has not been so easily laid to rest and has appeared in the most uncanny of places. What Kutsia could not have anticipated in the 1990s was the rise of managerialism in universities. And it's, it's on this as a possible site of return that I want to dwell here. As is frequently pointed out, managerialism has fundamentally changed the ways in which the core activities of universities are monitored and evaluated. But under the light of new forms of scrutiny and surveillance, above all audits and the activities that prime universities forwards, the core activities of universities have themselves fundamentally altered. While the accounts differ on exactly when and how universities began adopting private sector principles and practices, they generally converge around two moments. Firstly, the post-Second World massification of university education, the shift from elites to mass provision. In short, Diversity gave rise to concerns about standards and accountability. The diversity of students, but especially of teachers. Secondly, the neoliberal economics of the 1970s and 80s, which occasioned in universities a shift from public funding towards greater revenue from market oriented or entrepreneurial activities. And this was accompanied by an increased concern with efficiency and economy and types of forms of accountability. There's a lot more to be said about these two moments, about their relationship, and how this can and should be pushed even further to the back. I'm going to leave that aside though. There can be no question that managerialism has affected universities in South Africa. But at the time, Sia was writing this essay from his office on that academic bureaucratic castle on the hill. The first week of shifts was only just coming into view and on the horizon. The generally accepted formulation is that the shift towards academic managerialism begins in South Africa a decade later than the developed world. An unintended consequence of apartheid, Colin Bundy writes, was the delayed arrival in South Africa of the changes spreading so rapidly across higher education globalism. So at the very moment that post uh, apartheid South Africa was grappling with questions of how to democratize its institutions, it had inherited from apartheid, and addressing the qualities of the past, universities began introducing private sector principles and practices. And in a sense, they have become the instruments of regrets. While Cornier's apartheid no doubt still haunts South African university campuses, it is being exercised by what many scholars depict as a foreign invading force occupying the universities. Indeed, the associative drift from pathology and often enough psychopathology of an obsessional neurotic kind, uh, the drift from pathology to imperialism and colonialism marks much of the literature critical of managerialism in university. Actually, on Bembe goes as far as calling the effects of managerialism global apartheid in higher education. To put it in this way, an ordered culture, which is seen by many as a form of colonization or imperialism, is being used to monitor transformation, sometimes to audit the extent of decolonization. But whether one agrees with the bind this produces or not, the managerial university is nonetheless frequently described as, as alienating, where staff are treated as work units to be incentivized and measured. It's described as a space of surveillance and distrust. It has been said repeatedly that it creates a space of competitiveness, and this word recurs throughout the, the literature in which cooperation is made difficult. The casualization of labor has been on the rise for some time, the job security is weak, and all the administrative processes and procedures that must be adhered to exclude, if not academics as individuals from participation in decision-making, then the critical sensibilities from the judgments that they are forced to make using evaluative criteria given to them. So what follows is comprised of four sections. 
first I point to a conflict in the university. Second, I say a little more about audit and its discontent, and this will be very brief. Thirdly, if audit is the primary mechanism the university uses to understand itself, poorly, as, as many argue, I consider the ways in which the university is understood in scholarship, looking at the limits that it confronts and the repressions to which it is subject. Fourth, I'll say something about historically black universities. Mm. So, I'm glad to see Hannah is here on that, on that committee. The, the review was originally 40,000 words, then got whittled down to 10,000 words. And so what you are, are going to hear is a very truncated set of comments that I, I hope hangs together with, with some coherence. And there have been new concerns inserted here as well. So one, conflict in the university. I forgot to push the time out. That's very convenient. <laughs> Terry Eagleton, writing from the UK, has bemoaned the Byzantine bureaucracy of the managerial university. The specific forms of bureaucratization that come with managerialism can, I think, and should be examined for their unintended, often counterproductive effects. And Mbembe may have a point when he writes, quote, to decolonize means to reverse this tide of bureaucratization. But what Eagleton, Mbembe, and others may underestimate is the way that simplified, foster systems of digital administration are being used to champion the corporatization of universities. And despite the delayed arrival of managerialism in South Africa, frighteningly innovative, innovative solutions are being found here. As Diresh Ranjugana, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Learning and Teaching at Stellenbosch University, outlines his vision for the entrepreneurial university, quote, administrative structures need to become less bureaucratic. It's not entrepreneurial to take a long time to get the simplest thing done in universities. So what's at stake in this, I'm joking about states, is the very, quote, survival of the university. COVID-19, he says, has taught us that if we don't evolve and don't become innovative and entrepreneurial, we will go extinct. Notwithstanding the social Darwinist ring of these formulations, there is an appeal here and, and one worth worrying about, a promise that the university will become not only transparent and thus accountable in the services that it renders, but also able to more directly and more speedily address the urgent needs of an unequal society. So both those critiquing and those driving the introduction of managerialism make diagnoses of the crisis of the university and I'm going to leave out a long meditation on the word crisis. For the likes of Ramjugna, innovative and entrepreneurial practices are the cure for an institutional malaise that may ward off its extinction. He's to critics typical in his assertions about organizational well being and organizational survival. But the same language is frequently used by critics like Eagleton, for whom it is it's the flourishing of managerial ideology that is bringing about the slow death of the university. These are, it seems, the biopolitical, and some would say necropolitical terms on which a struggle over the university is being waged today, life and threats to it, conjured as either a toxin or stagnation, even necrotic rot, and for some that rot is the dead white men on, on, on the curriculum, and to others it's a, a slow bureaucratic club which left untreated or unflushed out, perhaps even unamputated, will lead to death and finally to extinction. There's a lot more to make here uh, of, of biopolitics, but the simple point that I want to underline is that there is a bit of conflict over evaluation to be acknowledged here. And that for the most part, the mere mortals conscripted into this, the excluding BBCs and tenured radicals like Eagleton, all battles must take place according to unquestionable rules of engagement, those of the academic marketplace. As Samuel Weaver formulates the university's law concerning conflict, it's martial law, we might say, scholars can and should study conflict. They can and should compete in the market. They should not engage in conflict. And above all, they should not disturb the forces at play, according to which competing arguments are put on offer or on special. As if Ramjukana's accelerated evolution of the university and Eagleton's slow ideology critique are merely different brands, peacefully coexisting like two blocks of cheese in the dairy section of a supermarket. 
So this is the disciplined state of affairs that works to, as Weaver puts it, deny the necessity of conflict. One can only question the commoditization of knowledge, production, and transmission, claiming that, look, I'm a scholar, not a piece of cheese, from the shelf, as it were, <laughs> to which the university replies that, yes, indeed, that does sound interesting. Perhaps we should invest in a bit of that. We'll take a pump, see if it sells, see if it increases our indexes of student satisfaction, <laughs> see if it satisfies our stakeholders. It's worth noting the difference here between what Weaver calls the instituted institution and the instituting function of institutions. This is where, John, your presence is a little anxiety provoking. I hadn't expected you would be, you would be listening in. All that is a discipline stabilization and ordering within which knowledge is conserved and transmitted, even and especially knowledge of ruptures, of breaks, of revolutions, the latter recalling that an institution is always also itself an inaugural rupture, a break, a breach of an old order, a bringing into being and a founding, the trace of which is carried into the instituted institution. Weber likens the instituted institution and the instituting function of institutions to what Immanuel Kant called determinative and reflective judgment, respectively. In this determinative mode, judgments are made by subsuming particulars under, quotes, this is from Kant, existing concepts. Whereas in its reflective mode, judgment proceeds, again from Kant, without the mediation of a concept. In reflective judgment, the criteria according to which a given object can be judged are produced through an encounter with it. Or, as Vlad Gotzik writes in commenting on Weber's work, Reflective judgment is, quote, what thought is engaged in when it proceeds blind to cut a path where none had been traced before. So this arguably goes to the heart of the critique of the managerial university. Nothing new is ever allowed to emerge. Warding off risks, translating real risk into strictly financial and thus controllable risk, and that's drawing on the work of Michael Power, the university forecloses any possibility of meaningful change. Under the managerial university of excellence, judgments are made using existing concepts drawn from the world of business. Teaching is not primarily about constituting shared social interests through an unequal pedagogical dialogue, what Wally Morrow called epistemological access, but about the extent to which the already constituted interests of student customers are being met. In governance, the existing Competing interests of stakeholders are negotiated, compromises reached. But no matter how cooperatively, no new concepts can be produced that might allow new syntheses of systemic contradictions. So, as I see it, beyond the stressed, strained, overburdened, and burnt out condition that managerialism engenders, it's the impossibility of producing new concepts that might orient academic work that is truly depressing for anyone interested in the justice to come. The point then of the framing would not be to substitute existing concepts of managerialism for those of any other ideological standpoint, but as Paul Reddings puts it, quote, finding ways to keep the question of evaluation open, a matter for dispute, so that the university can become a locus of dissensus. I'm not unaware of the tension between uh, Weber, uh, Weber and and readings, I have to leave that aside, and, and nor am I in a way that the census cannot itself be institutionalized. Now, this gestures towards the possibility of a freedom to question, suspend, and rewrite the rules of engagement with a conflict repressed by competition. Political problems with Kant's distinction between modes of judgment have been exhaustively critiqued and noted by post-colonial and feminist scholars and others. I won't get into them, only to note that to abide by the instituting function of institutions could never amount to a defense of the European Enlightenment. As Guy Chakraborty Spivak argues, however, our sense of critique is too thoroughly determined by Kantian critical philosophy for us to be able to reject them as one among other motivated imperialists. Nor can there be any easy disavowal of the glaring fact that universities in Africa are inherited European institutions. This conceded, 
and attentiveness to the instituting function of, function of institutions might amount to what Spivak calls an abuse, abuse of or constructive rather than disabling complicity with the European environment. The task post-colonial universities, including those in South Africa, face today is that you will recognize this quote, exploring how this thought, which is now everybody's heritage and which affects us all, may be renewed from and for the margins. You will recognize these words as, as that of Chakrabarti, provincializing Europe. The text whose limits I.J. Scaria drew attention to on Sunday. So having used this line as a kind of shorthand, it suddenly occurred to me that the shift from the University of Culture rather on nationalism to the University of Excellence, where, as Reddings notes, the nation uh, state is no longer capitalism's primary instance of self-reproduction, may make Chakrabarti's an inadequate formulation. In any case, this is why I asked I.J. about uh, our German inheritance, for which there is no word for faith, only belief. So section two, audits and its discontents. Audits produce quantified rankings and ratings of, of everything in the university, not only financial matters. And this is where the, the graph often comes in. Among the effects of audits identified by its critics are the following, which for the sake of brevity, I'm going to put into, into point four. One, audit creates the conditions for a divided institution. Managers on one side, academics on the other, with diminished collegiality and trust between them. Two, within the divided institution, colleagues within and across institutions are turned into competitors. Reducing cooperation, it is true, and that's a point worth noting in itself, but also repressing the necessity of conflict. Three, audits turn not only colleagues in, but institutions into competitors, stratifying a higher education landscape often perpetuating the institutional inequalities of the past and introducing new ones. And this, in short, is what Mbembe means by global education, uh, global apartheid in, in higher education. Four, whereas, whereas it is repeatedly claimed that audits encourage the university to critically examine itself, audits have led to an impoverishment of the university's capacity for self-reflection and judgment, except in simple financial terms. Five, Audits have been used to make universities competitive, but they've also been turned, as I've, as I've been saying, into an instrument that monitors the extent to which transformation is being monitored. But audits, as many scholars have noted, neither allow universities to adequately address issues of transformation, consider the absurdity of an award of excellence for decolonization, judged according to the evaluative criteria that many see as a new form of colonization, nor do they allow the university to think through the potentially or inevitably contradictory objectives of the university, holding them in tension. So a few brief comments before moving on from audits. They've been rationalized in the name of responsibility, where transparency of operation is everywhere endorsed, endorsed as the outward sign of integrity. By contrast, Shah Ferida suggests, quote, one of the tasks most indispensable to the exercise of academic responsibility is studying such evaluations. Likewise, Power argues for, quote, making the effect of auditing visible, an undertaking for which an audit will be inadequate. Audit, he states, will need to be evaluated rather than an audit. Such studies of evaluations or such evaluations of audits and there are very many more, and many of them are Foucauldian, um, appear to have only two possible outcomes at present. Either they have impact, so to speak, as far as they're published in monographs, accredited theory journals, and thus appear on balance sheets as income-generating outputs, or particularly when they take the form of internal reports, they encounter what Andre Keats calls institutional defense mechanisms. And here I would have liked to spend a little bit of time about what, what it is to speak of institutional reflection of an education. I'll, I'll pass over that word. Internal reports are increasingly compelled, and I know this because I write a few of them, <laughs> to operate as documents in public relations, staging marketable performances of success. And this links to uh, the 
Fernandez's presentation, uh, the productive reflection on failure becomes impossible. And considering the many fruitful traditions of scientific and philosophical reflection on failure, on botched and bungled action, this is almost an outrage. So three, if all its are oh, inadequate, let's think about studying the university. There is then, to return to the matter of conflict, a significant body of scholarship on managerialism and university, which contests. But as this literature suggests, the struggle against managerialism is for the most part limited to small, non-confrontational acts of passive resistance, sort of guerrilla warfare of only responding to the second or third reminder to populate another goddamn stretch in grasping what constrains but also solicits this resistance. It's instructive to read University of Johannesburg Vice Chancellor Chalitzi Marawala's recent article. This is the title of the article. As universities remodel their businesses, they need to be wary of losing poor mandates. As Marawala states, universities are fast becoming businesses. This is a long quote from a short article. People from businesses, from the, from the business world, must be at universities as council members, advisors, and lecturers. Projects that happen in universities must increasingly be co created with stakeholders such as businesses. <laughs> universities must set up labs inside corporates, and corporates must set up labs in universities. He goes as far as suggesting that academics should take their sabbaticals in the private sector. <laughs> this dissolution of boundaries, he says, must be accepted. This is the word he uses over and over, must. That's the primary injunction that sits at the head of his text. The R he underlines financial uh, funding realities that make it necessary. He then mentions right at the end of his text that, quote, we must also fight against the proverbial corporatization of higher education. It isn't a mere afterthought. The second injunction sits at the head of his article too, alongside the first in his title. So he's in effect saying, remodel the university, corporatize it, we must. But we must also fight corporatization, less core mandates for government. Marwala is careful to have somebody else name the enemy. According to such and such a scholar, he states, hard-nosed managerialism in Carroll's core mandates. He's careful also not to single out managers. It's managerialism that in Carroll's core mandates. And in, in a sense, I'm in agreement with him here. But with the cascade of musts coming down on two opposing ends, there's a, an institutional subject here who is inscribed as Derrida writes concerning a related double bind, quote, from the very beginning of the game into a necessarily double obligation. The injunction in effect divides us, not simply into two camps, managers on one side, academics on the other. It splits each person subject to the double bind, producing a psychic conflict or an institutional conflict registered psychically. And because that, that it is necessary is always doubled, this is again there that it puts us always at fault or in default. End of quote. With the university, but also for those like us who have identified with the objects of the university, with ourselves. And this is how I would interpret our into school theme. In the subject formation of the university, we are fragmented, we're divided against ourselves. So in the reactions to this piece, his critics were quick to point out the contradiction. I was heartened by the heading, Bill Haynes writes, and yet, and yet the whole article compels academics to accept the hard-nosed managerialism they must also fight. No doubt one could read this as a contradiction in his thought that he fails to iron out. I could also certainly read this as a pragmatic to keep producing knowledge within the constraints of new economic realities, to Produce for production's sake, as Eagleton puts it, even if it means, as he puts it, churning out supremely pointless articles. <laughs> Such a reading would, however, have to disingenuously ignore that it's a fight against corporatization that he invokes. So, how then are we to understand this strangely conflicted statement? My wireless heading 
can also, I think, be apprehended as an overdetermined statement that need not exclude the above possibilities, but would stand as a symptomatic expression of what Adam Seitz names, with UWC in mind, as the revolt that study presupposes. UWC is commonly understood as a struggle university, a site of revolt. But rather than presenting an opposition between study and revolt, or even revolt in the name of study, or in my wildest terms, a fight for the sake of core mandates, sites troubles the division between them, as I think my wilder does, despite himself or beside himself. But this should in no way imply that there's an easy exit from the double bind in which Marawala is himself caught. And this is because study and revolt are not intimately related, but rather, as Sartre puts it, extimates to each other. Put differently, study and revolt are the two sides of a constitutive ambivalence at the heart of the university towards revolt. <laughs> ambivalence should be understood here not as mixed feelings, but as two ideational currents that operate on separate planes, as Freud puts it, localized in the subject's minds in such a manner that they cannot come up against each other. If knowledge, in my wildest terms, harbors a fight, the latter is constantly subject to institutional repression, quelled insofar as outputs of study are translated, this is from sites, into the terms of instrumentalism, discipline, and the industrial division of labor. But while this ambivalence concerns, in a sense, a conflict over conflict itself for the university, a fight usually confirmed, confined to the objectified content and disciplinary rules of any analysis. As we, we were argued, in the repression of conflict within the university, the forced acceptance of the rules of engagement and inclusion into the market that allows different interpretations to exist peacefully though competitively, and resistance to these rules, which sometimes suffers remediation, sometimes exclusion, and sometimes banishment, are assigned to another plane that never touches, never comes into contact with the conflict in the object of interest. Familiar as this critique has become within the humanities, and let us simply call it the imperative to implicate interpretations in the conflict under analysis, the ambivalent power struggle nonetheless rages on. The introduction of managerialism can be likened. To a state of emergency. In which study, in the precise sense that science intends it, including and especially the study of the university is severely constrained. And it's not only with Adam Sites that this claim can be made. Gaini allows a similar formulation in the evaluative state. Under such conditions, what Sites refers to as scholae, in other words, the restful time in which thought, unoccupied by any other activity and free from both the necessities of labor and the exigencies of politics, is able to enter fully into relation with itself, scholarly becomes difficult, if not impossible, to sustain. On the terms of this new norm, such rights, those, I love these lines, those who propose to treat the academy as a space for serious play or critical thought cannot but be comprehended as unmarketable and useless vagrants. The more one tries to embody scholarly today, the more one can expect to be understood precisely as a scholarly someone who is to be expelled. This formulation entailing expulsion, or precisely what a captain of the industry the university is becoming, says scholars must carry out, recalls we this plea for, quote, a re-evaluation of the necessity and the legitimacy of conflict, as he puts it. Conflict as an object of study, but also as the medium in which thought itself operates. There's much more to say here, specifically about the difference between the conception of the uh, subject. What kind of subject does my wallet presuppose? What kind of subject does the university presume and presume to discipline, incentivize, and penalize? To my mind, it makes, it makes all the difference. And I'm going to leave out a long section here on Fanon and Freud, where I turn to precisely the questions in Fanon's eyes and his body which Moritz discussed on Sunday. 
I don't disagree with him, but I draw from Fanon's questions different implications for the university's ambivalence over conflict. Let me simply end this section a bit abruptly by turning to Weber. It is only in the recognition of such ambivalence, he says, of the university attitude to conflict, and in the articulation of its social and institutional consequences, that the rules of this game can be put into question if they are not to continue to be the rules of the academic marketplace, which would delegitimize conflict, even as it compels competition. So if the rules of the, if the rules themselves are at stake in this recognition of ambivalence, it is because, quote, winning by following them will not follow, but rather, this is the end of the quote, their, it will be their renewal, their reconstitution. We're back here, however, at reflect judgment. Can we be satisfied with the generation of rules of our own, with this notion of autonomy derived from the Enlightenment? Perhaps not, but we also cannot escape the necessity to rework it. How does this necessity appear from the vantage point of historically black universities in South Africa? How am I doing with time? Badly, not that good. <laughs> <laughs> conversation. Well, then it's actually fine just to, to, to stop. It's at this point that I turn to ZK Nakhles on and, and Premesh on UWC, where precisely this, this problem has been, has, has been brought up. I don't have to go into that, that long section of the book to tell the conversation, but just to say that this is, this is really the, where, the, where, the, where the question opens up. What the vantage point of uh, historically Black universities in South Africa offers is not simply no, let me stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we hear that? Is that yeah. what does that? Let me choose a. You know, it's a rather long search. <laughs> I'll simply say this. I don't romanticize Zed K. Matthews' writings about the university of Forte, even in the 1920s when he was studying there, although they may have led me to go and study there and realize that it didn't exist anymore, uh, or even what he does afterwards. But I do hang on to something that he calls the freedom to study. And he doesn't overlook the Eurocentrism of the curriculum that he is free to study and to transgress. But he does say in working out this problem that we may have to make use of all the knowledge the wide world has to offer. And in that phrase, I return to, to, to the problem set up by Kutsia and uh, to ban on mixing. I know that's a sort of clumsy formulation, but I, I would like to put those two things into a more subtle and provocative relation and into, into an encounter to think of think about it. Uh, but I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Um, I'm sorry I made you feel awkward. Um, <laughs> not really, but I guess one place to start here is just to think a little bit about uh, your language. Um, as I was following, I heard several things that seemed almost like um, synonyms, but I wasn't sure. So I heard managerialism, I heard entrepreneurialism, I heard corporatization, um, these are not the same things, it seems to me. Um, they have something to do with thinking a little bit about how they inflect your, your concept of institution. And, and just a kind of bibliographic gesture. I don't know whether you've looked recently at um, Mary Douglas's book on institutions, but it, it picks up in, in provocative ways the, her, her fascination with purity and danger and these kinds of tensions. Um, and in, in particular, how they manifest 
when an institution assumes the agency of a structure. Um, so I guess if there's something to be said for how one might differentiate those terms, I wonder to what extent they also track um, something having to do with the encounter between capital, um, and now I think we're talking in terms of global capital and institutions of so-called higher learning. Uh, in other words, it, there, there's, there's a point there at which instead of trying to figure out um, some typology of the university, which culminates typically now in the University of Excellence, um, I'm wondering if there isn't something here about how we might understand the university's position in the struggle against capital. I mean, at some point, what we're trying to think about is how to produce a crisis. And I think I know where you were heading with that conversation. And I'm not sure that we, we do that very consistently. Um, and th there are points here when this conversation in Britain um, takes the sort of reductive turn of saying, why are we worrying about the critique of the university, why aren't we building socialism? Um, so I, I think that there's something here to be said for trying to get clear about what these variations, managerialism, corporatization, commodification, what are these tracking in terms of this conflict between let's call it a mode of production and uh, an institution like those things we lump together under the heading of university. So there's that aspect of this, um, but I, I'm also thinking about um, your sort of fleeting reference to freedom in this. I mean, they obviously this follows from, but it's not the same. Um, the freedom to study. So what are we talking about? Uh, I mean, in other words, how do we understand freedom in a formulation like that? I mean, because of course, another inheritance out of the, the, the German dimension of the enlightenment was this pairing of, you know, the freedom to teach and the freedom to learn. Now those freedoms, as they have become um, sort of watchwords in struggles about and within the university, they have not always consistently thought very carefully about what freedom means when we're dealing with it in those terms. Does it, does it connect interestingly to um, you know, what Haraway used to like to call staying with the trouble? Um, in other words, occupying the, the ambivalent relation to conflict. Um, and what would it mean to um, assert or protect that? I mean, I think in the US context, affirmative action, um, academic freedom, you know, these kinds of formulations um, all kind of keep off the table, the, the meaning of what's being affirmed, of what is free. And there's a kind of sordid history to the uh, American Association of University Professors where freedom was very much understood as the opposite of, of communism, of precisely some kind of political project that might intervene in the relation between capital and the university. So I, I understand that uh, as is my characteristic tendency, I've not really asked you anything directly, but I'm, I'm asking you to um, sort of think aloud with us a little bit about some of these kinds of, of questions. It's a good one, I think. It's not so much a question so, uh, as much as it is something just that I'm trying to think my way out of because I feel like it's, this is what's currently happening in my head and this has started from your presentation, Marit, on, was it Monday? Was it Sunday? Sunday. Um, 
you know, thinking about uh, blackness, blackness and humanities. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So um, <laughs> this is a, like what you're doing is it's very big work. I think it's very, very important. Um, you know, we just having a conversation. Yes, I was just having a conversation with Heidi and Mesh yesterday about um, we're speaking about care, right? And we're speaking about the institution and how care can be retained, right? Um, within the institution, thinking about you know like the broader capitalist structures that it kind of like hinges on in its own way, right? So thinking about that, and then here is the point where I struggle, um, you know, a little bit. I don't know if it's within the humanities or if it's within the institution as a whole, but it is a point of struggle for me that I'm trying to break through. And that point of struggle is, is um, okay, I'm just going to put it, it's not the focus on blackness, that's not my, my problem, right? But sometimes I do feel like there's a kind of like a re-inscription of violence um, in, in, in due to the way, um, you know, because of the fact actually that we have to make the orders. Um, sometimes I feel like there is, you know, because we have to, you know, produce papers, then it also like the study of blackness then becomes like the easy reach, the easy thing, you know, to pull onto and to study and then to scrutinize. And in that sense, it becomes violent in itself because then, um, you know, the black body then becomes commodified, you know, in, in that sense as well. So like, I'm really stuck there, like, and it's a very traumatic space, um, you know, to, to be in, um, to, to, you know, to think in, I don't know. And it, in, in some way, it affects free thinking um, for me. So, I don't know, this is just something that I'm, I'm thinking towards. And I, I think what you have presented on, I keep wanting to say Monday, on Sunday, um, I think it was like, it's such a great intervention. And then it comes together so well with your thinking about institutionalization. And I'm trying to think now towards the future, I'm trying to think um, towards what the future of the institution would be, trying to think about the great more space, what the future of that would be, and just the essentiality of care in that. Because I think if we're moving towards care, then you know it would, be, it would create such great freedom um, for thinking, but how then do you, how do you conceptualize, conceptualize care or how do you, how you make care practical as something that works within uh, a very capitalistic, you know, society, um, you know, uh, within an ins uh, institution that expects the audience, that expects for you to kind of like meet, you know, um, whatever, entrepreneurial, I don't know. Yeah, so that's just what I'm thinking. Learn from hearing difficult questions from my almost four-year-old daughter. An answerable question is the best way to say it. That's an excellent question. <laughs> Together. And I don't mean that deliberately. I mean, yeah, I would, I would like to think about these questions together. Um, and so I appreciate I, I appreciate you sharing uh, your experience. Um, okay, let me start with John's. Uh, John, I don't have, I mean, I have some sense of the difference between managerialism and organization, entrepreneurialism, and so on and so forth, but I don't think I have anything to share that will be worth all of you listening to and I'm handling my way through. Um, it is worth noting, though, that in the ways in which this affects universities across the world, there is definitely an argument to be made that at South African universities, um, an audit culture, for example, has not totalized the field, and that there is a space. Uh, there's greater space here than in the UK, for example. Or, you know, um, I, I forget what your precise words are, but they are in my uh, concluding section, for you know, um, deliberation and, and, and collective reflection on the direction of what most of us might, might look like. Um, that said, I would offer a typology, not of those managerial and corporatized entrepreneurial universities, although they may be one to be made, but of universities in South Africa. And there is a fundamental difference um, between here, apartheid universities and the historically open universities that have never ceased to defend uh, the academic or freedom and, and, and autonomy. The key point to make, I think, is that any challenge to managerialism or whatever you want to call it that proceeds from the grounds of a lost autonomy that historically black universities is, is inadequate. These changes, whatever you want to call them, have been introduced upon the grounds of um, a, a form of, I don't know what to call it, native 
managerials, the production of racialized subjects. The institution was, after, certainly after 1959, autocratic in its, in its governance structures. Insofar as academics were drawn into those governance structures, they were trained in historically white Afrikaans-speaking universities. There's no academic autonomy, no lost golden age of academic freedom on which to draw. So if the conclusion of somebody like Paul Reddings is that the university is in ruins, a new founding concept must be found or made up or invented, this finds a really a, a fresh significance from the university like uh, Fort Hare and, and UWC. That invention becomes yeah, imperative precisely because it may never have previously previously existed. So related to that, what do I mean by, by, by freedom? Um, I'll read three lines from the concluding section. This freedom flashed up for Matthews as a freedom not from external constraint or evaluation. No sane person could make such a plea for to be free from accountability, even after a genealogy of that term. But a freedom of a program of study to give an account of itself and in doing so produce the criteria according to which it can be judged. And that lands you straight back into the blackmail of the Enlightenment. It, it, it is true. But um, it's the reworking of that in which there is a possibility. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's, that's, the freedom, that's the freedom I'm talking about. Um, I don't know what to say, except that I'm, I'm listening. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. Um, but I hope we can talk afterwards. And as you know, just from the global apartheid uh, sessions we had last year, these things are we are having to think through the institution's power, how power is operating, how our power begins to shape us. Um, and so, so one of the questions I have is, are you proposing to some extent that audit culture and materialism, like it produces currents of madness that they might kind of grab all the people and in that way people become split from themselves. So that's the, the one question I have. And then the other question that I have is around this idea of cattle. You, you talked about a, a captain of industry who kind of knows the rules of the game. Um, and I'm wondering, what about captains of like planes and ships? And, you know, um, what do these captains do? And, and how do those captains kind of translate into pawns that sit around a table of board of directors? And, and now this idea of, of directing, it's like it's not the managerial space, it's, it's this, and you've got this capability to direct the madness. And I'm just like, I'm thinking about this because in all of what you said, like the idea of the board of directors doesn't kind of feature, obviously. And yet that's the space that extracts so much from us in terms of the direction it gives in the founding principles of space. So like what enables that kind of thought or that kind of thinking to shift from the university as a caring space to a space that kind of sanctions and enables the mass production of people and of knowledge. And like me having to become an entrepreneur, I don't have a bone in my body that will allow me to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, so anyway, so, so I suppose I'm wanting to ask if you're proposing whether the audit culture, managerial culture, does it produce currents of madness? 
Uh, yes, Ross, I don't really have a, a profound question, but just wanted to thank you for the service, for the gift in the sense you've given us uh, to, to think through these things. And I think it's true that winter school is a reflection of that, is that as academics, we're very good in, or we try to be good in exchanging uh, ideas and, and, and learn from each other dialogue across international borders. But we, we're less good maybe in, in thinking through uh, comparatively across different institutions, uh, the conditions of, of our academic work. Uh, that often is, is, is bracketed out in, in international exchanges. Um, uh, so your, your, your uh, wide perspective of, of, of the broader context in which these changes are this is happening is very important. Uh, and and to, to just um, pinpoint the, the, the salience of this, um, I was in, in, in a part of a report I was writing, reflecting also on, on the international experience of postgraduate supervision and research at, at UWC comparative to, to international uh, practices. And the person in charge of the whole postgraduate area at UWC, the director, basically shot at the sun and said, international is completely irrelevant to what we do at UWC because we are only answerable to the Council of Higher Education check in, in terms of in our institutional practices. So, so international is completely not uh, relevant. So that illustrates, I think, uh, a sense of the, the, the vital importance to, to, to engage as academics in international uh, conversation to, to understand more broadly what is going on. So, so thank you so much for, for taking a step in that direction. A couple of um, perfect questions to, to, to land in your direction. I know you think about these and I know you probably write about them in your longer, your longer paper. So um, the, the first is to think about freedom and conflict, um, particularly working from sites, you know, the freedom to, to study your, your, your um, reading of ZK Matthews, um, to learn from the Enlightenment so as to transgress the Enlightenment, um, whereas to embrace managerialism while resisting it is conflict. So you have freedom to study, but you also have conflict. So I was wondering where the difference is between those two. So that's, that's one question. The second one is, I was, I was wondering if you could think if auditing, I mean, and obviously I can't escape. I, mean, I, I, I thought John was gonna ask you a question about auditing and, and listening, and I'm, I'm not going to ask you that question. Um, but um, listening to, to Bongi's question, and to your talk, I was wondering if there's a connection between chaos and care that, that we might need to think through in terms of creating space for the invention of concepts. When auditing in the institutional sense is about closing down any kind of space for the new. I wonder if introducing chaos and Chaos and care are, are a diet that we need to think for that. So that's the second quick question. The third one, which you touched on, um, I wanted to ask you about the tenured radicals <laughs> that, you, that you mentioned at one point. And I mean, Calgary can came to mind straight away like, that academics shouldn't call themselves activists. You know, they're in a privileged space. But tenure particularly has never existed at UWC, right? So I guess this, this kind of, this kind of um, tag builds on, on Herman's question, right? Your English speaking liberal universities in South Africa and your white Afrikaans universities, your professors have tenure, but, but you don't have that at black universities in South Africa, right? You are always, adjudicated, evaluated, and cut down to size in at black universities in South Africa. Yeah. With the, by your own institution, but also within the institutional landscape of higher education. So I'm wondering if you've, if you've thought that difference as part of your, your work. 
Then he goes straight back to the question of care, which has been, which has been really raised. And the only way that I have to respond to this is that clearly a lot of care needs to be taken in comparing uh, Jeffrey Cornier's um, bad repudiation of any desire for difference and what, what, I, what I'm pointing to as the ex expulsion of certain enlightening texts from, what, from our reading lists, for example. A lot of care has to be taken in putting those into any kind of re relationship. My point is not what should or shouldn't be on the curriculum, but it's about how those decisions come to be, come to be made. And in the longer report, there's a very, a very long discussion about the bourgeois public sphere as a space of deliberation and the critique of that and the way that it leaves out any form of um, affect, difference, um, women's bodies, any mark of difference, uh, and the subaltern public spheres that have you know, been mobilized as responses to these, and the critiques of those subaltern public spheres that have you know, emerged and the long conversation about public spheres. Um, I think care can be taken in how we come, how we come to decisions and in how we listen to each other, irrespective of what is or what is not included or excluded, because decisions have to be made. Um, the point about madness and audits, I would love to talk about madness and audits. The, probably one of the, the, the most sustained studies of audit is Michael Powell's the, the Audit Society, and he, he sketches it in terms of two possible scenarios. The one is where the, the field of the university is entirely colonized by audits. Uh, good teaching becomes the pursuit of an auditable moment. Um, you know, we're having this one to school so that we can write a report about it. And we thoroughly believe in it and, 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 and you know, we are saturated by its, by its logics. And one even begins to ask when you're teaching, hmm, I wonder if this is going to be a, a, a return on the investment of my time and energy and you know, blah, blah, blah. The other, uh, he doesn't call it this, he calls it, I think, decoupling, but you could call it auditory hallucination. Where we go about our business here, we have our conversations, we, 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 we deliberate in, in ways that we find meaningful, and then we write an entirely parallel report about it, which has got nothing to do with what actually what actually happened here. We have to hallucinate this for the for, for the audience. And so it does become a sort of a schizophrenic subject, but there's still certainly a good amount of hallucination to satisfy uh, the, the, the order that is inevitably coming. Power does not see either of these as, as satisfactory, and in fact, as the university happens, uh, these two are frequently ac accompany each other. They are braided into each other. They are, they're, they're, you know, there's a sort of there's a sort of a mix between auditory hallucination and colonization by by audit, and there are ways of resisting and even finding it productive within that, that kind of constraint. Morris, um, I, I appreciate your comments, and I'll only be able to, to speak to one about this. Um, it's true there may not be any uh, tenure which doesn't allow one to attend to the politics of knowledge production as one ought to, but at the same time, in interviews, they can ask you, are you a scholar activist? Which only becomes necessary because the politics of knowledge production and knowledge transmission is not fully allowed. I'm, I'm not against scholar activism, of course, but it becomes a compensatory mechanism when the conflict at the heart of the university is not allowed, when a statement on it is not allowed to circulate, when we encounter a blockage to the sayable and the thinkable, which is basically the definition of regression, where there is in Weber's terms the conditions of imposability. And I think that's what we May, may experience. Um, let, let me stop there. I'd love to hear what other people think. That might be a, a question and answer because this is a new field for me as well. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I must just first uh, say that um, the word managerial to my Brazilian ears is sort of almost new in a way. It's very shocking to say that, but we have a tradition of free state-funded, free public, free state-funded universities. And they are all on the threat of corporatization and privatization and all that. So, but we do have a tradition of these uh, 
three uh, universities. And in your talk, uh, I guess what I want to, to propose is uh, um, to think about these categories that you have displayed as the main ones, managerialism on one side and the academics on the other. And coming from my own experience, and I'm talking here totally as a foreigner because I really, I think, ignorance to the, to the reality that you are uh, depicting, but I think that uh, through the difference and friction from what I can uh, posit here, maybe we can uh, discuss something. And that is, um, my design school was hardcorely uh, influenced by European matrix, a design formalism, uh, rationalist uh, tradition. And then uh, from some decades now, we have had affirmative action students come in. And these students who didn't know, for instance, what the MoMA meant, or even Bauhaus, or even the Luther, nothing like that, they completely changed the landscape in the classroom, the landscape of teaching, the act of teaching, the practice of teaching. In other words, professors who were used to have a homogenized audience and were very comfortable talking this dialect of rationalist design, all of a sudden were forced to actually to review this language that they were so naturalizedly using and actually to start to recognize the knowledge that could come from those people who are arriving. And I guess what I'm trying to, to, to propose is um, to put together with these two leading actors that you have uh, raised, you know, managerialism and academics. I wanted to know if you, if there is a way of thinking about the role of the students and how their life, like, like their repertoires, can come in and sort of short circuit um, this cycle of, of, you know, just the academics thinking and the managerialism thinking on, one, on, on the other side, and how is it that the students could change the landscape of that discussion? I wonder if uh, that would be a question. Um, Ross, and thanks for your presentation. And it's quite an uh, interesting also that uh, uh, um, speaking immediately after Marcus, because we actually we start exactly from a, a completely different point. In terms of uh, uh, immediately when um, when you said about uh, the freedom to teach, uh, and then John uh, added uh, the point about uh, in the US it was related to do the freedom from communism. Immediately come to my mind the experience of teaching a, a Brazilian university under the current government when they, they started with the idea of uh, a scholar in partido that is a uh, is the school of party. This is not exactly about uh, being without any party, like uh, but it, about being a, a, a neutral teaching uh, practice, uh, so you don't have to you don't have to show any kind of position. And in this uh, in uh, in this sense, uh, I think that is related with the idea of making university uh, a peaceful, neutral space uh, and avoid any kind of conflict, which means also avoid any kind of uh, differences. Because differences are always related with conflicts. Uh, you you must find a way. To, to put difference in that. And so um, I was thinking uh, also, uh, no, uh, well, let's this. Is. Going back to your list of the audit and its discontents, I uh, want to consider your productive reflection on, fa on failure and how that becomes impossible and to think about what does it mean if we ask about a reflection on productive failure rather than a productive reflection on failure. And I'm thinking a little bit here with uh, RJ Scaria's meditations in the last couple of days about the minor uh, and thinking about puppetry and pre the great idea that Premish introduced into the conversation a couple of years ago about improvisation. Uh, and think about that in relation to the illusory imperative to find the university of excellence. Thank you, Ross. That was superb. Um, there's lots to say and lots to, to, to engage with. Uh, two questions. One around you know, the way in which we present the problematic or the thought about freedom. 
And, you know, I know that, you know, John, in that early lecture that Helena cited, gave us reworking uh, all the, you know, qualifications, but also, you know, Spivak's abuse of the Enlightenment as two possible ways of proceeding. I've been wondering about the squandering of freedom. And whether, you know, when one thinks about, you know, how universities squander freedom and whether there's something to be said about, you know, that discourse. So when you think about the historically black university, I always imagine there's a certain kind of, you know, squandering of, of, of a resource uh, that is never taken to its full potential, never realized in any significant way. And whether that gets you around some of the, you know, the, whether that gets you into a space of a more affirmative, kind of rendering of the, of the question of the university. The second question I have is really where we start the biography of the university. And the word that I, that kind of drops out of the conversation is the way in which the modern university is constituted in the moment of a uh, revolution in scientific method, right at the moment of the end of or abolition of slavery in 1834, uh, both in the Cape and the Caribbean. Um, so Jane was talking about, you know, uh, uh, Maxwell's demon yesterday. You know, I mean, the, those effective ways in which scientific method redefine the protocols of, of the university. So I'm wondering about, you know, the multiple points of departure, the many beginnings of the biography of the university, and how, in some sense, one might trouble what is circumscribed as a managerialism by also bringing attention or calling attention to some of those. Premise your one point about what you're raising is the, the, the biography of the university and, and where it begins. I have two points. One of them is, you know, like it's obviously occurred to me that there are African institutions of higher, higher education that you, you couldn't easily call universities, but there, there is, you know, there are obviously long traditions that predate even the medieval universities of, of, of Europe and so on and so forth. And I'm really interested in, you know. On the one hand, uh, medieval European modes of evaluation, which were severely harsh. You know, students made and um, professed no, masters pay a deposit up front, you know, they didn't live up to it, you know, they withheld it. You were late for class, you know, like the deposit sort of thing. Um, but I'm interested in how um, those, you know, come back to you and, and other institutions, what modes of um, accountability were there? And, you know, we can't go back to them or we can't, you know, draw directly on them, but how might they offer a, a sort of inspiration for developing other um, freedoms to give an account of, of how one studies. The other about, about science is that, it's a, it's a very quick point, is that what I have suggested may pose the humanities as the, the rescuer or the, you know, saving the university. That's absolutely not, not the point at all. In fact, when we look points out that uh, in, 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 in sounding out reflective judgment, uh, Kant is in fact first, he first goes to experimental sciences yeah. and only then comes to you know, elaborate aesthetic judgment. This, this has to be a dialogue as your work will attest in your ongoing conversation with the, with the sciences that this has to be worked out in, in, in conversation. As for failure, I mean, uh, you know, we should write our reports together in this, in this way. You know, turning them into confessions would obviously defeat the point. But yes, there are, there are certainly foreclosed ways of, 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 of thinking productively about it. Very difficult moments in seminars, for example. I, I won't go into a catalogue of, of the of them from this last year, but you all, some of you will remember them. Why can we not speak about this as, as something to learn from? Um, uh, and, the, and the question, I think, you know, Marcus and Laura, uh, about how students uh, may be a part of this conversation. I mean, this is something that we thought about intensely for at least two years, over 2015 and 2016. Um, I think that the point of departure for having this conversation may be to really look at the the difference between an old disciplinary model of, of, of education, which sounds like it's something that you were invoking, and a more recent, highly modularized, credit-bearing, uh, lifelong learning model of education. 
and a reworking of both of those and a synthesizing of both. One cannot stick one's head into the sand and pretend that they are not new realities, where people have to re-enter the universe at yet later points in their life and throughout their life, and that modules may well be may well be necessary. But they do each have a different presumption about how the student enters the university. In the, in, the, in the credit bearing modularized one, the student is presumed to have preconstituted interests they would like served, and the university is measured against how they serve them. And, and you know, they know what the students know what they want. At 18 years old, they know exactly what they want. Whereas the other model of discipline, which I, what one cannot simply go back to, there are obviously enormous problems with, but the student enters into a conversation through which societal interests will be thought about uh, and, 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 and constituted through an unequal pedagogical dialogue. Um, and I think that there's something to be held on to in that as we rework and, and, and move forward. So the students, I don't think, can offer any solutions. I know as, well, as a student at 18, I certainly have a lot to offer. <laughs> to, be, to be perfectly blunt, but in that conversation, which is not lo located in any one person, uh, something can emerge. Um, that, makes, that makes sense. It may sound a little condescending, um, but I speak as a student. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Ross. Thank you, everyone.